for the one last scene playlist, more on that at the end, Derry Girls and Brighting Ceasefire. 1. Menos. He had just finished his evening meal, the table was still set up. Great Priam entered unnoticed, he stood close to Achilles, and touching his knees, he kissed the dread and murderous hands that had killed so many of his sons. Passion sometimes blinds a man so completely that he kills one of his own countrymen. In exile, he comes into a wealthy house, and everyone at him stares in wonder. So Achilles stared in wonder at Priam. Was he a god? That's a passage from near the end of Homer's Iliad. You've just heard Stanley Lombardo's English translation. It's a last scene. Not quite the last scene, that's the funeral that follows, but a last scene of the epic. It's the centerpiece of Book 24, the 800 or so lines that close out Homer's raging tale of the Trojan War. Much of this sprawling poem, the lion's share of the roughly 16,000 lines you'll have read upon arriving at the Trojan King Priam's meeting with Achilles, have concerned the rivalry between Achilles the Greek, son of a goddess, fiercest warrior to ever live, and Priam's favoured son Hector, the best of the Trojans, shining helmeted defender of his people. The Greeks and the Trojans have been at war for nearly a decade by this point, but most of the Iliad takes place during a kind of deadlock. Achilles is the only man alive fearsome enough to take down Hector, who stands as the last real bastion of Troy, but due to poor leadership, well not really, but sort of I'm summarising, Achilles has laid down his arms, he's had a falling out with his general Agamemnon. Both men know that the Greeks can't beat Hector without Achilles. Make no mistake, the Greek ranks are stacked. The big burly Ajax, the fiery Diomedes, the other Ajax, they're all warriors of uncommon ferocity, but Hector is a foe second to none. Or rather, second to one, Achilles, who isn't fighting, so the carnage continues. People die a lot. It'd be hard to oversell the amount of this poem that's just gruesome blow by blows of people dying, all in different ways, all more or less for nothing. That's one of the things that sticks with you, even after finishing the Iliad. You think back to it, you see hazy visualisations of a handful of scenes in your mind, Aphrodite talking to Helen, the death of Patroclus, Menelaus' duel with Paris maybe, and then just the images of cold, senseless death that attack you over and over. Eventually though, the deadlock breaks. Achilles is pulled back in by the death of his close companion, the person he loved most in the world, Patroclus, who died impersonating his partner in a last ditch effort to spur the Greeks to an impossible victory. When Achilles finds out, he stops eating, he smears himself in ash, and he picks up his spear once more. He's been warned by the gods that he himself is fated to die not long after Hector does, but Achilles doesn't care. He leaves instructions that his remains are to be mixed with those of Patroclus in a burial urn, he returns to war, he kills Hector easily, and defiles his corpse. Hector's family know that their fates are more or less sealed now. They know that without its defender, their city is doomed to fall, but all they want is to recover his body and the chance to bury him peacefully. So Priam sneaks out. Aided by the gods, the king reaches his enemy's camp and enters Achilles' tent, supplicating himself. He stood close to Achilles, and touching his knees, he kissed the dread and murderous hands that had killed so many of his sons. Priam does something that goes against every fibre of his being. Priam needs a ceasefire. He gets it, but this is the price. This is what must be done. Hold on, this is supposed to be a Derry Girls video, isn't it? 2. Protestants Hate Abba The last scene of Lisa McGee's achingly brilliant sitcom Derry Girls isn't really a scene, not technically. It's a montage, a collection of little scenes strung together. We're shown Erin answering James's question, how does it feel to turn 18? We're shown a great many of Derry Girls characters, major and minor, voting in the referendum on 1998's Good Friday Agreement, the document that all but ended decades of violence in Northern Ireland. Before we skip to the future, see moments of documentary footage spliced in of the agreement's aftermath, of the peace process, and of the British government starting to take responsibility for its role in the violence. What happened on Bloody Sunday was both unjustified and unjustifiable. On behalf of our country, I am deeply sorry. In amidst all this, lines of Erin's answer to James float into focus. No matter how scary it is, we have to move on and we have to grow up. But it kind of is a scene too. The centre of the montage is undeniably the voting. 
We see our core cast enter, we see some of the adults and all of the youth vote yes, we see them struggle physically to do this, and we hear the results, 71.12 yes, read out. We hear the cranberries' dreams fade out, we see the screen fade alongside it, as our characters leave polling station number 246. And barring a quick flash-forward callback gag, that's curtains for the show. The final episode of Derry Girls is about this, about growing up, about the endurance of hope in times of suffering, and about the price you pay for peace. The scene in question, the end, my one last scene, is the capstone to this, the part that focuses a great episode into a great statement, but it's also just an emotional sledgehammer, heading right for the tear ducts. When I was deciding Derry Girls was to be the focus of my one last scene video, I sat down to rewatch that last scene, and even though I knew how this episode ended, even though I was just watching a couple of minutes, not even the whole thing, I was almost bawling by the end. I've dipped back into it a whole bunch while writing this video, and it's the same every time. I can say with complete confidence that every one of you who has seen this episode has seen this scene, had a similar experience, felt the raw, cathartic power Derry Girls ends with. The aim of this video is to dig into just what that feeling is, and what makes it hit so hard. In case you're not familiar, Derry Girls was a UK teen comedy that ran for three seasons and a total of 19 episodes between 2018 and 2022, following a group of school-age friends in the city of Derry during the 90s. We watch Erin, Orla, Michelle, Claire, and James navigating school life, family, sexuality, and the sporadic violence of the so-called Troubles, the ongoing irregular war that no, look, I'm not going to explain the troubles here, because I can't explain the troubles here. I'm not a historian, nor am I Irish, obviously. I don't think I could explain it, not in a way that would even begin to get across the layers and the complexity. You know something's messy when Wikipedia's summary for it starts four centuries ago. It was an off and on, mostly on, struggle between people who wanted Northern Ireland to be independent of the UK and people that didn't, fought just as much with terror as with guns, caused in large part by, you guessed it, Britain's colonial history, with no real, no asterisk necessary good guys. Tons of people died, thousands more were injured, and the majority of those were innocent civilians. If you want to learn more, there are a lot of pretty solid resources here on YouTube, so that's one way, and another, to be honest, is watching Derry Girls. The show's been praised for a lot of reasons, and one of these is accuracy. The show captured the reality of the time to both Catholic and Protestant viewers, but the show strikes a balance between dwelling on this stuff and, well, not. For instance, the first episode opens with an excerpt from Erin's diary, stressing the pressure of always being watched. But it turns out she's not talking about the soldiers so much as she is just small-town life. The thing about living in Derry is there's nowhere to hide. Everybody knows everybody, knows everything about everybody. After this, the news comes on and tells the Quins there's a bomb on the bridge, and Mary is aghast because it might delay her getting the kids out of the house. No. Suspicions were raised when a hijacked van- Oh dear God, no. Does this mean they can't get to school? I've had a whole summer of it, Jerry. She's melting my head. Until the finale, Derry Girls had almost always engaged with the Troubles at a slight distance. Even when an episode brings the context into sharper focus, even when this is done extremely effectively, that focusing tends to be kind of peripheral. Season 1, episode 6 ends with an abrupt cut. We've been following some school drama, which comes to a close as the gang makes up with the newly outed Claire and dances together, symbolizing an overcoming, a move toward tolerance, and then. In what is already being described as one of the worst atrocities of the Northern Irish conflict. At least 12 people are thought to be dead. It's a gut punch, but the punch doesn't come from our main characters suffering from the violence. It comes from the juxtaposition the episode creates between their little step toward coexistence and the bomb's cruelly blunt reminder that all this is happening amidst evil, indiscriminate violence. The girls themselves are still dancing away. So our characters don't so much grapple directly with the practical, emotional, or ethical problems of the conflict as they contend with its comparatively mundane knock-on effects. Michelle can't admit to owning vodka, so the bomb squad's called in, or another threat means they miss the end of a film, or a fugitive steals their tent. This isn't the case in the finale. 
Here, the troubles protrude into the foreground in a way rare for Derry girls from the get-go. Because if this could end decades of violence, death and fear, then surely any concession, no matter how difficult, is worth it. The people of Northern Ireland are gearing up for that referendum. We've time-jumped a year on from the rest of Season 3 for this purpose, and the episode starts with birthday girl Orla signing up to vote. It's not like the show 180'd into being the crown or even the thick of it. It is still Derry girls. This is still Orla. So you need to read this before the vote. Is it any good? Well, I mean, as peace treaties go. Because I've just finished the line, the witch in the wardrobe, and... But there's clearly a political focus that we'd more or less avoided beforehand. There is a lull after this. You start to get the idea that may have been a false start, that this episode won't be that different after all. Our lives will never be the same. Again. It seems like the episode's conflict is going to be the clash between Erin and Orla's birthday parties, that this will dance lightly in front of the weighty background, as is Derry Girl's tradition. She agreed to let her air great. She signed off on it weeks ago. Monkeys are class. Stop it. You'll just have to compromise, girls. Compromising's all the rage. Sure, everybody's at it. Look, I'd be willing to settle for gorillas. But then we cut to a school assembly on the referendum, arguing for forgiveness. Let's put the past behind us. And let's choose hope. Thank you. To those of you who have already turned 18, I strongly urge you to exercise your right to vote. It's your future. Take it seriously. Erin doesn't care, but strangely, Michelle does. Because Michelle's brother killed a man. We learn this a few scenes later. We learn in the 19th of 19 Derry Girls episodes that one of our main characters has a brother who's been locked up for murder. If I was your Niall, I'd be begging them to let me finish my stretch. No one could be worse than sharing a house with you. Oh, fuck off, Dennis. And that's never actually going to happen anyway, so... They're saying it, Mike. Well, I'm not going to get my hopes up. As the finale makes clear, a key part of the referendum was the early release of paramilitary prisoners. People like Michelle's brother Niall. People worse. Nearly 2,000 civilians died during the Troubles. Many at the hands of the British, but many more at the hands of paramilitary groups. Politically, the early release of paramilitary prisoners was a necessary part of the deal, or at least it was seen to be, but morally, it sickened much of the public. It was met with outrage and disgust. As a television asks our characters, asks the viewer earlier in the episode, how can you have peace when you release gunmen and bombers onto the street? This is the problem Northern Ireland faced in 1998, and as quickly becomes apparent, it's also the problem at the heart of the Derry Girls finale. What was the face all about? What face? Earlier, when Dennis was talking about Niall, you did a face. I didn't do a face. I've seen you whip it out over a dozen times. Usually when you find something hard to believe. What was hard to believe in? It was just when you said that you didn't want to get your hopes up. You don't actually think you should get out, do you? Who's my brother? He killed someone. It wasn't supposed to happen the way it did. I'm sure that poor man's family takes great comfort in that. These things, they're not black and white, Erin. Aren't they? This time, the problem isn't the delays the bridge bomb causes, it is the bomb. The finale's conflict is the conflict. It's whether or not letting killers and terrorists off can be justified. It's whether or not Erin and Michelle can still be friends in the wake of this clash. Whether the Derry girls can come together ever again. How can you forgive something like that? How can you look past it? Or alternatively, how can you not understand that things get messy in desperate times? How can you just abandon family outright for picking the wrong shade of grey. How do you even know it was the wrong shade of grey? Maybe you should though, maybe it was the wrong shade, but if so, how do you do that? None of these questions are really answered. They weren't answered in real life either. But Erin and Michelle make up. You know I've never even visited Niall. And I won't let me. She won't let any of us. She won't even say his name anymore. I'm sorry, Michelle. You weren't wrong. I mean, you weren't right either. There's no answer to any of this, is there? No. I don't think there is, you know? Neither one really changes their mind. Not really. No resolution is found, and yet, they come together and move on together. They do what must be done. 3. Ceasefire 29 years ago, early in September, in the wake of an unprecedented ceasefire, the Irish Times published a poem by Michael Longley called Just That, Ceasefire. I'd like to read it for you, don't worry, it's not very long. 
Put in mind of his own father and moved to tears, Achilles took him by the hand, and pushed the old king gently away, but Priam curled up at his feet and wept with him until their sadness filled the building. Taking Hector's corpse into his own hands, Achilles made sure it was washed, and for the old king's sake, laid out in uniform, ready for Priam to carry, wrapped like a present home to Troy at daybreak. When they had eaten together, it pleased them both to stare at each other's beauty as lovers might. Achilles built like a god, Priam good-looking still and full of conversation, who earlier had sighed, I get down on my knees and do what must be done, and kiss Achilles' hand, the killer of my son. I am being slightly ahistorical bringing this in here. Longley's poem was in response to developments which had end up leading to the IRA ceasefire in 1994. That wasn't the same thing as the Good Friday Agreement, and it happened a few years earlier. It even gets some play earlier on in Derry Girls, providing another one of those last minute contextualizings in season two, episode five, the prom episode. But the 94 ceasefire was a very important step towards the Good Friday Agreement. It paved the way, according to the Derry Journal, and as we can see by the way Longley responds to it, the way the response hit home with readers across the island, the moral conundrum posed, the cost of the ceasefire, the sense of awful, unforgivable necessity, seems to anticipate the choice the country, the choice Erin and Michelle would face a few years later. Because Longley's poem succeeds at tuning outsiders into the atmosphere, the hope and despair of the late troubles, to the unwordable complexity of ceasefire, for the same reason the Derry Girls finale does. It's the same bitter counterpart to the sweet promise of peace, the doing what must be done, the releasing of the prisoners, the coming together without resolution, the kissing of Achilles' hand. I don't think it's a stretch to imagine the similarity here is intentional, that ceasefire, its unresolved, and its reception were conscious points of reference for the show. Again, the poem made a splash. But regardless of whether McGee had Longley in mind while writing this finale, it is responding to the same dynamic, the same problem, answering the same emotional moral question Longley's poem raised. So what is its answer? Well, for that we have to look to the end of the episode, not Erin and Michelle's coming together, but the last few moments Derry Girls gives us afterward. We have to look at that one last scene. Four. One last scene. In this last scene, we're shown Erin answering James's question, we're shown the characters voting in the referendum before we skip to the future. We see the voting, we see our core cast enter, we see some of the adults and all of the youth vote yes, we see them struggle physically to do this. Immediately before the montage begins, we'd watched Erin talking to her grandfather Joe, as the old man sits with her little sister Anna. She's worried. What if it's for nothing? And the people who took those lives, they're just going to walk free. You know, what if we do it and it was all for nothing? What if we vote yes and it doesn't even work? This is after she and Michelle had made up, after Erin's come to terms morally with Niall's release, with all the rest of it. What if this latest hardship, this latest sacrifice doesn't pan out? It's almost the prisoner's dilemma. Erin, the public, the guardedly optimistic yes voter has done the hard thing, has put their faith in this unknowable other party, in all these unknowable other parties. What if this concession isn't taken in good faith? What if that compromise is thrown in their face? Face. The optimists would be made fools once again. Peace, hope, would slink further out of view. You see all this racing through Erin's head. She's almost trying to talk herself down. She's almost given up before the vote even takes place. But then her granddad asks her a question in response. What if it does? What if no one else has to die? What if all this becomes a, a ghost story? You'll tell your wins. A ghost story they'll hardly believe. And that's the thing about hope. You don't need much to get going. And as we see in that following montage, as we see in that one last scene, just the faintest prospect of it is enough to buoy Erin, to have her walk fearlessly into the booth and into her future. Because things, well, they might just change for the better. Another moment in the scene, Erin says this. And if our dreams get broken along the way, we have to make new ones from the pieces. I love this line, and it's so important. It expresses three things simultaneously. First, trauma. Erin doesn't talk about dreams not coming true, she talks about dreams getting broken. And that's a little detail, but a hugely telling one. It suggests the fragility of human ambition, the way the things we can take for granted can all go away in a moment, and phrases that suggestion the way only someone who's lived in that fragility would think to. 
I don't think an Englishman or an American would have thought of that line. But of course, Erin doesn't dwell on the image. It seems to come naturally. She doesn't even notice how wrong it sounds. That's the second thing this line gets across. Not merely trauma, but the way that trauma, the way a life lived between bomb threats, has become utterly normalized. She doesn't know anything else, but she wants to. She's determined to. She will. Rubble can be salvaged and used to build things anew. That's thing number three. The way hope can rebound from anything, so long as there's space for it. Writing on the IRA ceasefire and the timing of Longley's poem, critic Maureen Alden writes, Although the ceasefire from the 31st of August 1994 did not hold, after it, things were no longer quite the same. She goes on to quote County Derry born poet Seamus Heaney, who wrote the following the week after Longley's ceasefire was printed. The cessation of violence is an opportunity to open a space, and not just in the political arena, but in the first level of each person's consciousness. A space where hope can be developed and can grow. This then is the answer Derry Girls gives. Yes, reaching for a ceasefire, doing what must be done, kissing Achilles' hand is hard, and it might be for nothing, but it opens that space, and with room to grow, hope can lead to anything. At the start of this video, we talked about another last scene, the one that inspired Longley's poem, Priam and Achilles, all that. And that was one of the last scenes of the Iliad, but it wasn't a last scene of the Trojan War. A ceasefire followed, but it only lasted 12 days, then the fighting begun anew. Before long, Achilles was dead, Priam followed shortly after. Troy fell, survived by a handful of refugees. Many, most of the Greeks who'd sacked it died too, either on their voyage back or as they reached home. That ceasefire was a strictly temporary truce. It was to bury bodies. It was a technical timeout, a pause necessary for war to continue. And there's no room for hope to grow in one of those. In universe, the gods demanded the fighting resume. Out of universe, the oral tradition Homer was working within demanded the gods demand that. The ending was a fixed point. The soldiers, even the heroes and kings, had no say. That's how stories work. But it isn't necessarily how real life does. Everyone knows the story of the World War I Christmas truce. In the winter of 1914, at various points on the front lines, Alliance and Entente soldiers spontaneously called ceasefires. English and German troops crossed no man's land and talked. They sang carols. They might have even played football. But not everyone knows that in many places, this sort of thing had been happening since well before Christmas. And not everyone knows that a reason these informal truces were as limited as they were didn't build build into anything more, was the fear among officers that it would undermine the fighting spirit. With enough propaganda, or dehumanization, or state power, or placed for long enough in repressive conditions, yes, people will fight, will kill one another. But that goes both ways. With enough contact, enough time spent living together under war, regular or irregular, in trenches or in terraces, Humanity triumphs. Ceasefires can become spaces of hope, rather than simply a war catching its breath. And people become willing to step back together, to do what must be done. And maybe that isn't always enough. Maybe sometimes that hope is for naught. Maybe it doesn't work. But what if it does? The last scene of the Iliad wasn't the last scene of the Trojan War, but the last scene of Derry Girls was, in a very real sense, the last scene of the Troubles. Problems continued, sure, and post-Brexit things look a little ropey every now and then, another time Britain fucked up, gee fancy that, but so far, the peace set in motion by the Good Friday Agreement has held. This ceasefire wasn't temporary, because in the end, it wasn't predetermined, wasn't up to an oral tradition, or gods, or kings, or Britain, or any state. It was up to the people. And even though betting on peace was hard, maybe the hardest thing to do, they did it. Maybe, fundamentally, people don't want to kill each other. So, in a sense, Derry Girls is cheating. It can put all its eggs in the hope basket. That approach was vindicated over 20 years before it was written. But I don't think this cheapens the ending. I think it does the opposite. It proves the empathy, the humanism, the show, the episode, the scene displays has an empirical basis. It's not cockeyed optimism. It is a historical fact that peace can prevail, that things can get better, that every once in a blue moon, to again quote Seamus Heaney, hope and history rhyme. 
because that happened here. Prisoner Dilemma good ending, the boats didn't sink each other, the Joker looks like a chump, and optimism wins. Most of the time, you're sad when a TV show you love ends, but Derry Girls ends in a very clever way. The show juxtaposes war and life. Hey, another Homeric parallel, fancy that. That's rich ground for drama and for emotion, but the tension it places our characters in between ordinary teenhood and horror is obviously unpleasant. The more we get to know them, the more we long for them to be able to live normally. So the show ends, and that's a shame, you don't get to watch any more Dairy Girls, but by tying the end of the show to the end of that juxtaposition, the release of these people into real peacetime, the typical sadness is inverted. The end of Dairy Girls means the end of that juxtaposition, it means Erin, Orla, Michelle, Claire, and James cease to really live for us at the very moment they start really living themselves. You'll never welcome an end more. 5. Conclusion so what provokes that emotional response? What makes it hit so hard? On the one hand, you've got the standard finale stuff, the banger cranberries cut that backs it, the knowledge that this is the last time we'll be seeing these characters, the fact that in their last moments, we can see they're growing up, that they've really matured. We see this in the contrast between the voiceover Erin ends the show with and the diary extract that opened it way back in season one. And then you have everything beyond that. In this last, soaring scene, we see fear conquered by hope. We see evil conquered by good. We see belief, not in Catholics or Protestants, in loyalism or republicanism, but in humanity and in the future. The feeling of this scene is the feeling of seeing a leap of faith, maybe the most important one any of these characters will ever take, and the feeling of seeing it pay off for real. We see hope, and we see, we hear, that hope's vindication as the montage blends in authentic historical audio, wild, primal screams of elation from the reading of the referendum's result. Yes, 71.12%. <laughs> And it hits so hard because the result of all this is something quite remarkable. Derry Girls is able to convey, to even the most privileged, most sheltered viewer, how the prospect of peace feels to those without it. Some ceasefires aren't spaces where hope can grow, they are just wars catching their breath. Sometimes hate, propaganda, and state power choke the idea of hope almost to death, unaware that charred, blasted victory won't give anyone peace, will push it further away than ever. Every war is different, every peace is different. What Derry Girls does in this last episode, in this one last scene though, is present a euphoric and viscerally life-affirming vision of what happens when people on all sides do the hard thing, dare to hope for peace instead of victory. The the way ceasefires can snowball into agreements, can lead to real, permanent change, can give a whole country and a whole generation their lives back, if given a chance. Thank you for watching. And if you enjoyed seeing some YouTube guy break down the closing moments of a piece of media, hey, great news, there's more. See, One Last Scene is a collaborative playlist organized by Nando V Movies that right now contains a bunch of videos on the same theme from some very talented creators, and it's open for submissions. So if you want to join in on the fun, make a video essay on a last scene and shoot it to Nando on Twitter or wherever. You can find a link to the playlist in the description and in the pinned comment, and huge Huge thanks to Nando for including me here. I'd also like to thank Wolfie the Witch, the artist behind that kick-ass comic of Priam and Achilles I showed you earlier, for being kind enough to let me use that piece here, so go give them a follow. And in case you're new here, welcome, hope you enjoyed the video. I've got a bunch of other videos on my channel, all focused on getting to grips with pop culture and the discourse around it in a vaguely similar way. And if you think I cooked here, hey, I don't know, maybe consider checking out my Patreon or YouTube membership system down below. Going into 2024, the way this channel works might need a bit of a rethink. On that note, this will probably be the last video for a little while, so any support will go a long way in helping the juicy analyses keep coming. Huge shout out to all my current backers you're seeing now though, thank you all so much, especially Hanan, Daniel Goldhorn, Karen Kuhlman, Magath, Brian Emily, Something Something Capitalism Bad, Thomas R, and Weirdy Beardy, and I'll see you all soon-ish.